Hi everyone, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to share some thoughts on Love by Toni Morrison. I read this novel for the first time last week. I was one of the few remaining novels from Toni Morrison that I had left to read and I did love it. I, I found it to be very formal in terms of the innovation, in terms of what I felt Morrison was trying to do with her book in terms of stream of consciousness. Um, but it was also fantastic to see that in this book, her, her great power as a novelist is on display and that is a power to love characters who the, the world or who society has not loved. Characters who perhaps do not love themselves because they've never been taught to by the world or by society. Uh, and so, so that ability was on display in this novel. Morrison has, has a great capacity to empathize with these, with these people, with these characters, and to, I think, really develop that empathy at, in the reader. Uh, honestly, from, from a perspective to, to seek to, to transfer that empathy to individuals in the real world. And I, I felt that was on display in love. Um, I think it's also an interesting novel in terms of this transition novel within her career. I think as a writer, uh, when, when, when I've read her, her works, as a reader, I should say, um, as a writer, I think she had two phases. There's sort of the first 30 years of her career where she was bursting with these ideas. She was very much took, you know, what we think of as the, the novel within the 19th and 20th century, you know, Western canon, and took it on its own terms and wrote her, herself into that narrative, wrote her perspective into that narrative, uh, wove her, her threads in very thoroughly and very well, um, and, and really advanced that, that conception. And then in the final third of her career, she returns to the themes she's explored. She returns to ideas that were in the bluest eye, Sula, um, Song of Solomon, Beloved, and she revises those themes. Uh, and, and I think Love is really the first novel where she's she's very intentional about doing that. And it continues through um, really the late masterpiece of Mercy and even Home, I think very much are, are works that revise earlier novels she had written. So Love, in many ways, is taking themes from the bluest eye. It's taking uh, ideas from Sula, I would say, and even Tar Baby, and rewriting those themes, putting them in, into new contexts with new characters, and really, I think, uh, d delivering a, a new perspective on what each of those fantastic novels was trying to say, and, and that's why I appreciated it so much. Uh, but I wanna get in, I wanna give just a sample of why this was one of the great writers from the US in the past century. Our weather is soft, mostly with peculiar light. Pale mornings fade into white noons. Then by three o'clock, the colors are savage enough to scare you. Jade and sapphire waves fight each other, kicking up enough foam to wash sheets in. An evening sky behaves as though it's from some other planet, one without rules, where the sun can be plum purple if it wants to, and clouds can be red as poppies. Our shore is like sugar, which is what the Spaniards thought of when they first saw it. Sucre, they called it, a name local whites tore up for all time into sucre. Nobody could get enough of our weather, except when the cannery smell got to the beach and into the hotel. Then guests discovered what up beach people put up with every day, thought that was why Mr. Cozy moved his family out of the hotel and built that big house on Monarch Street. Uh, and so, so we have that, that wonderful explosion of color uh, and, and Morrison's ability to just conjure up words to attempt to describe what our senses can actually perceive. And that's happening here across the novel. Uh, early on, one of the games I like to play when I read a Toni Morrison novel is how long does it take her to hit all of the different senses that a reader could, you know, that a human could experience? So not just what we see or what someone says, you know, but actual sounds we might hear, the sound of a doorbell, uh, the sound of uh, spoons clinking as they're put into a sink. It, it creates this authenticity and realism around the experience uh, of the characters. What a kitchen smells like when somebody first walked in, what it feels like to reach out and touch something that's frosty and ice or to feel one slipping. And so all of those sensations are, are sensations that are on display in the early pages of this novel. And again, lend that, that verisimilitude to what's going on. Um, but then the way that she transitions from this, these beautiful images to that sense around like, oh, the, the smell from the cannery and the, the smell of a marsh or a fish, and that's awful. Uh, the way that those, those sensations turn so quickly and pivot uh, is I think, again, fantastic. It keeps a reader uh, focused and, and trying to move with the narrative in the same way that Virginia Woolf was so uh, skillful with, with the stream of streams, plural, of consciousness in uh, Mrs. Dalloway. And so what we have here is, is a book that allows um, us to see several generations of characters. I think there are some ways in which the book compares well with Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury, the way that the narration seems unreliable, it's not entirely clear 
who's talking about another character always. It's not entirely clear uh, initially what year we're in and what years uh, different narratives are occurring in, different memories are occurring in, and yet it all comes together very well. By, by the, the final chapter of the novel, and I would say really in roughly the last 30 pages, the elliptical nature of this novel um, really is achieved. We, we discover that, like Euripides, Morrison has sort of given away the plot within the first 15 pages. She's, she's outlined it very well, but we don't know why all of these things happen. We, we've heard a couple of strange, weird coincidences. Uh, in particular, one character, May, is described as uh, going and, and just being terrified of the civil rights movement. So we know we're after that, that time period in the US, um, but that she's terrified of the civil rights movement and that you know other others sort of regard her as, as a very unstable person. Uh, we're told that someone had gone and buried the deed to a house out on the beach. Um, and so we're, we're told some information, but we're not necessarily told who did these different things. Uh, and we're certainly not told why any of these things happen. And what we're introduced to rather is an outsider character who has arrived, a woman from um, a much younger generation who is now answering an ad to be a companion uh, to a, a much older woman who's essentially shut in uh, in this massive house on Monarch Street, that house we heard about. And there's another woman who lives in this house well. So Heed, one character, has posted this ad and the junior, the, young, the much younger woman, uh, has, has responded to. But there's this other character, Christine, who's living here. And we, we've heard, sort of heard mention of these characters, but we don't really understand their relationships. And we don't understand uh, their relationships to each other until the very final, as I said, 30 pages of the novel, and it all sort of falls into place. Um, it's, it's a mystery novel in many ways with, without there, it ever being clear what the crime was. You know, who, who's, who was violated and how was that person violated until the final, as I said, 20, 30 pages of the novel, where as a reader we can perceive the, the threads of these fractured relationships and, and these, these fractured lives but the, the characters don't necessarily understand those. And, and that, as I said, is, is where I think the empathy is generated within the book. But I wanted to give another example of the, re the reading. Young people, Lord, do they still call it infatuation? That magic ax that chops away the world in one blow, leaving only the couple standing there trembling. Whatever they call it, it leaps over anything, takes the biggest chair, the largest slice, rules the ground wherever it walks, from a mansion to a swamp. And its selfishness is beauty. Before I was reduced to sing-song, I saw all kinds of mating. Most are two-night stands trying to last a season. Some, the riptide ones, claim exclusive right to the real name, even though everybody drowns in its wake. People with no imagination feed it with sex, the clown of love. They don't know the real kinds, the better kinds, where losses are cut and everybody benefits. It takes a certain intelligence to love like that, softly, without props. But the world is such a showpiece. Maybe that's why folks try to outdo it. Put everything they feel on stage just to prove they can think up things too. Handsome, scary things like fights to the death, adultery, setting sheets of fire. They fail, of course. The world outdoes them every time. While they are busy showing off, digging up other people's graves, hanging themselves on a cross, running wild in the streets, cherries are quietly turning from green to red. Oysters are suffering pearls. And children are catching rain in their mouths, expecting the drops to be cold, but they're not. They're warm and smell like pineapple before they get heavier and heavier. So heavy and fast, they can't be caught at one at a time. Poor swimmers head for shore while strong ones wait for lightning silver veins. Bottle green clouds sweep in, pushing the rain inland where palm trees pretend to be shocked by the wind. Women scatter, shielding their hair, and men bend low, holding the wound's shoulders against their chests. I run too, finally. I say finally because I do like a good storm. I would be one of those people on the Weather Channel leaning into the wind while the lawmen shout in megaphones, get moving. Um, and so that, that, that characterization of love and, and the, the depths, the lengths that humans will go to, to to prove that they're in love. And I think specifically to prove to themselves that they're in love or, or to prove to themselves that they're not in love are extraordinary. We, we make jokes about these ideas all the time, but uh, on, on a very real level, it, it's a deep and, and visceral emotion, one that, that allows, I think, many people to feel like they're not in control. And what this novel is exploring is, is the many facets of that, uh, the, the love that should exist within one's family, the love that should exist within one's partnership or marriage, the love that should exist um, between close friends 
who, who have shared experiences that perhaps a family never has, that someone from another generation never has. Uh, and yet what, what Toni Morrison reveals is how quickly that love can be sundered. She, she mentions, you know, the idea of the ax chopping, but what isn't, what is left unmentioned there is the idea that, that those relationships can also be chopped very quickly by an ax. Um, and, and I think that those are ideas she wants to explore, she wants to get at, particularly uh, the love between two girls who grew up as friends and as adults are the bitterest enemies. And can they ever repair that relationship? I, I think, as I said, akin to Sula, the love that, um, that, that can be terrorizing because it's not love, that something that, that pretends to be love and masquerades as love, but is actually a very deep um, evil. Uh, as in the bluest eye, and that's those you know those again are ideas that I felt were really well produced here. Um, there are uh, some very funny moments, some very comical moments, um, and and I I enjoyed the book overall for that. But again, I, I really just found it to be thoroughly impressive. There there were ideas that had me sent me back to the very beginning to reread whole sections of the book um, as I was moving along because little pieces fell into place. And I, I thought that it, it became a very interactive text in, in many ways. And that's what I meant by the formal innovation that I felt was on display in this book was I, I think Morrison was very intentional about what she was doing. Uh, and, and I appreciated that as a reader. As I mentioned, of course, I think Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury with the um, sense of multiple unreliable narrators, the sense of a, fa a family saga that spans multiple generations uh, was was I think a reference point for this. I would add that um, James Baldwin was a very explicit influence, a, a, a deep uh, sort of foundation, I think for Toni Morrison as a, as a young reader and as a writer as she developed. And there are ways in which I was trying to, to conceive of like, where did I see James Baldwin's influence in this novel? And I haven't necessarily figured out where that is. I haven't picked it out specifically, uh, but I'd be fascinated to know if anyone else has, because I'd like to sort of connect those threads. I think that would be critical. Um, the last thing I, I would mention is I find I, I found this book to be really interesting in terms of the once again the community of characters that Morrison created and and that's something I think she excelled at in a way that Zora Neale Hurston excelled at as well. Um, in contrast to the way that Richard Wright or Ralph Ellison's um, strongest novels very much depicted African American characters as not only minorities within a, a, a society where um, they, they lack power, they lack agency, and, and they're trying to find a sense of self, a sense of agency, um, that within the, the novels, they are also m minorities within the community depicted in their novels. And so as characters, they, they perhaps uh, are, are, are pushing against the, the restrictions that they have th that were in place for them, um, restrictions that in many places still exist. What Zora Neale Hurston and I think Toni Morrison excel at is showing communities um, where that's not necessarily the case, where uh, individuals have, have gathered together in a community. They, there are people who are successful business owners who are black. There are, there are people who are, are in positions of power within the community and how that dynamic still reveals so much of humanity in its best and in its worst. Uh, and so that, as I say, was, was sort of a contrast. And I think it, it's uh, very much on display here uh, in, in a very thorough and, and effective way. So I really enjoyed this. I, I do have one or two, I think two novels left from her to read. So I'll be getting to them eventually. But it was nice to see that, that, that arc begin of the great revision of all of the themes she had um, explored in her early novels. So I'd be happy to hear other thoughts on this, uh, particularly if anybody has a connection to James Baldwin. But I hope you're doing well. Thanks.